So I'm going to answer, try at least try and answer three key questions. So the first question is, what is a clinical case series? What are the key features of a clinical case series? And then remember, it's right at the bottom of the pyramid. So what's wrong with a clinical case series? So what are the major limitations of a clinical case series? So a clinical case series fundamentally is a descriptive study design. It reports on the outcomes of a number of cases sharing a particular characteristic. And clinical case series, by definition, are non-comparative in and of themselves, although often what will happen in the literature in review articles is authors will make comparisons between results from different clinical case series. And generally, clinical case series are considered to be useful for hypothesis generation. So this is a clinical case series that was published in the 1981 edition of the CDC MMWR. And all that this case series described was five cases of PCP pneumonia um, in San Francisco. So I just bring this example forward to sort of suggest that clinical case series really can have incredible impact on us. So this was the start of the AIDS epidemic. So this is the first description of HIV was in these, these five cases, and they suggested that there was some common ideology to these PCP pneumonias. So it's not to immediately, well, it's just a small case series, let's dismiss it. They can, can be important. So clinical case series can be retrospective, so they classically are retrospective, but they also can be prospective. So the way I think about retrospective versus prospective is where was the study design occurred relative to what you're interested in. So if it's retrospective, the design occurred after the treatment or the outcome, whereas prospective, you obviously have to design it before in order to collect the data prospectively. <coughs> so in terms of the cons of retrospective versus prospective, so retrospective because the outcome of the treatments occurred already, we have very little control as to what variables we're able to collect. So whatever is in the chart, whatever is documented, and for those of us who write in charts all, all the time, we know that we often miss stuff and we often have incomplete notes or illegible notes, and that's going to lead to a lot of missing data. Also, because it's happened in the past, we have no control as to what the way the intervention was administered. What, what's happened, it's happened, and all we can do is um, record it. Pro pro prospective um, case series are going to be much more expensive because you're going to need infrastructure in order to uh, collect the data, and they can be very time-consuming. If we think about outcomes that take a long time to develop, and thinking about surgical procedures, long-term complications or long-term outcomes, if you're going to be doing a prospective study to look at those long-term outcomes, you're going to want regular follow-up of those patients for a prolonged period of time. That becomes very, very expensive and time-consuming to do. So the pros, so why do we do retrospective studies? Well, they're cheap and fast, and they can be quite useful for those long-term outcomes. Prospective studies, the main advantage is that you're able to decide on what outcomes and what variables you want to collect, and it's probably easier to ensure complete follow-up of, of your subject, and that you have a group of subjects that you're interested in at the outset, and at least if you have loss to follow-up, you know what your loss to follow-up is. Retrospectively, it's not as easy because there might be cases that you never knew about to begin with. So the key features of a clinical case series are the eligibility criteria, the exposure or the intervention, and then your out finally your outcome assessment. So the eligibility criteria are going to define your population of interest, and this is going to determine to whom the results of that study are generalizable to. So, in, so the more similar the research subjects are, the more similar the intervention is to your patients or practice, the more likely you can expect similar outcomes to those outcomes described in the case series. So this is just a schematic of looking at eligibility criteria. So we have... It doesn't work. Okay. So we have the... The outer circle is the general population. That's everyone out there. The next thing we have is we have all patients with the disease. 
What we then do is we establish eligibility criteria. And that determines the subset of all patients with the disease in whom we're interested in. However, we can't study all the patients with a particular disease. Therefore, we're going to need to have recruit or enroll patients in our study. So that's where you're going to get through your enrollment, you're going to get your study sample. So this is a key concept not only for your case series but also for your clinical trials. This same concept applies and when you're looking at this, ideally you want your study sample to be representative of your target population. And when you have issues in, in either recruitment or enrollment of subjects, then this no longer reflects the population of interest. So the idea is, is that your eligibility criteria defines your population of interest. So the exposure or the intervention. So in a clinical case series, your exposure is either going to be a medication, it could be an operative procedure, or it could be non-operative management of a particular condition. Finally, you need to determine your type of outcome measure. So we have a number of possible outcome measures that we can consider. So we can consider clinical outcome measures. We can consider biological outcomes. We can consider patient-derived outcomes, such as quality of life, or economic outcomes. Ultimately, the type of outcome that you decide on is going to, is going to be based on whatever the goals of the study is. However, when you're thinking about an outcome, it's incredibly important to adequately define what that outcome is, standardize it, and standardize how you, how you collect it. So what th this was a very nice study. I can't off the top of my head remember what journal it was in. And what they did is that they looked at agreement between three different outcomes of surgical site infection. So infection is a very common outcome in, in surgical studies and surgical trials. And if you look at this, depending on how you define infection, the infection rate was anything from 20% to 7%. So it's going to have a, and these are using you know, standardized published measures of what um, constitutes a surgical site infection. So when you're making comparisons between clinical case series, you need to consider sim similarities and differences in terms of your population of interest. The, out, the intervention or the exposure that the clinical case series considered as well as your outcome pr parameters. So that's both important when you're comparing across clinical case series, but also when you're trying to think about those, the applicability of the results of that case series to your own patients. So, the limitations. So first of all, these are fundamentally non-comparative studies. And you're going to hear over some of the other talks this morning some of the problems with non-randomized studies and in terms of making comparisons within patients within the same study. So you can imagine there are going to be huge issues between patients that are in different studies altogether. And it also shares the main limitations of all non-randomized designs, and that is that the choice of treatment is not determined by methodology but rather by other factors. And there are a whole other load of other factors that it might be. It could be physician preference, it could be patient preference, it could be different clinical features, economics, or the physician skill. Physician might you know, choose one particular approach because that's what they're particularly skilled at. And we, we, deter we term all of these potential factors to be confounders. So confounding may result in important differences between the patients who receive various treatments when results from case series are compared to one another, and these differences could impact your outcomes as well as your conclusions. So when do I think we should be thinking about case series? So ideally early in experience with novel treatments. There's fairly limited ability to make inferences as to the relative efficacy of a treatment but at least you'll have some idea as to whether, you know, what the results look like and whether it's worth pursuing this further in other designs in terms of generating hypotheses for further future studies. Sometimes in rare conditions, this is the best you're going to get. So you're only going to see five or six patients with a particular condition over a number of years, and you want to report the outcomes of your treatments. And then in the settings of limited time and resources. And I think that for, you know, when you're doing research in residency, this is often going to be your first publication because this is a quick 
you know, descriptive case series is easy to do, and it's, a, well, I think, a very good introduction to getting published, but then obviously you're going to want to move on to more advanced designs that are going to have a much greater impact. So just to close off, a clinical case series is a non-comparative research design that describes the outcome of a group of patients who share particular well-defined clinical characteristics and in whom the outcomes are determined by standardized, objective, and reproducible means.